The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, the Lord appointed 72 others whom he sent ahead of him in pairs to every town and place he intended to visit. He said to them, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Go on your way. Behold, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Carry no money bag, no sack, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. Into whatever house you enter, first say peace to this household. If a peaceful person lives there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in the same house and eat and drink what is offered to you, for the laborer deserves his payment. Do not move about from one house to another. Whatever town you enter and they welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick in it, and say to them, the kingdom of God is at hand for you. Whatever town you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, the dust of your town that clings to our feet, even that we shake off against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God is at hand. I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom on that day than for that town. The 72 returned, rejoicing, and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us because of your name. Jesus said, I have observed Satan fall like lightning from the sky. Behold, I have given you the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and upon the full force of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice because the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. One housekeeping note before I start. Um, my schedule, uh, not expecting to have been moved, my schedule for the summer was very much uh, a campus minister's schedule. Uh, so over the next seven weeks, I have four weddings from college students um, that are out of town, and then a vacation and retreat. Um, so if you don't see me every now and again, it's not you. It's, it's me, all right? I'm not running away. Uh, so next weekend, I won't be here. Uh, Father Michael Rotan uh, will be the priest celebrating the Masses next weekend. Um, Father Rotan was actually my pastor, my very first pastor. Um, when I was ordained, we were up at St. Joan of Arc together in Hershey. Um, and so they say that you, you become a lot like your first pastor. Um, so if you have any complaints already, uh, take it up with him next week. That would be great. So thank you for your, your patience with me as we settle into this together. Last week, we picked up with the Gospel of Luke again as we entered back into ordinary time. And we saw that at this moment in the Gospel, Jesus, right, he resolutely determined, he set his face to Jerusalem, to that place where self-sacrificial love will be demanded. And so he invites his disciples to follow him, to come on this journey with him. And that you and I, for the next five months, get to enter into this journey from Galilee to Jerusalem to learn what it means to be the disciple of Christ, um, to, to go to that place where self-sacrificial love will be demanded of us. So I guess the, the next question, or valid question from that is, why, why would we want to go to that place of sacrifice? Like, why would we want to take up our cross, right? That sounds hard and uncomfortable, unpleasant, right? Why would we want to do that? What, what, is, what is the offer, right? What does Jesus propose to us as the offer for why we ought to do this? Um, so to do that, I, you know, we're, we're in St. Luke's Gospel, and instead of going, like, 
more focused, I still want to have that zoomed out approach, right? And St. Luke's gospel is fantastic. St. Luke, um, you got to remember, he wrote this gospel um, kind of to be digested as a whole, right? We take months upon months to read a little bit at a time, but he had written it for someone to just read it all. And, you know, those who have come to faith in Christ, the gospel was meant to um, continue to nurture that faith as a whole. And St. Luke, of all the Gospels, is great for us. St. Luke, he was the, right, he was the companion to St. Paul, uh, who was the missionary to the Gentiles. Um, and so St. Luke's Gospel is very much written for a non-Jewish audience, right? So most of us who don't have a, a background in Judaism find St. Luke's Gospel one of the easiest to digest. Uh, that's why if, you know, if anybody ever asks you what is, you know, what is a great Gospel, if they've never read a Gospel before, which one should they pick up and read? I always suggest St. Luke's. It's the longest of the four, but it's, it's the easiest one, I think, um, for us to, to grasp. So St. Luke, so if you were to ask St. Luke, right, kind of why, like what is, what is the offer made to the disciple if they're willing to go to Jerusalem, to that place of self-sacrificial love, and you look at the whole gospel, what is like the, that primary gift Jesus gives? There's a number of themes in the gospel, but one of the main themes for Luke is joy. Right? The gospel of St. Luke is sometimes known as the gospel of joy. And the idea is that, you know, for the disciple, the gift of joy is what Jesus offers if we're willing to go to the place of sacrifice. Right? Uh, if you don't believe, you, you just look at the gospel and joy runs throughout. From the moment Jesus is, is conceived in the womb of Mary, right, what does she sing? She sings, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Right? And then she goes to the house of Elizabeth, her cousin, and it says John the Baptist leaps for joy in the womb of Elizabeth. And then on the, you know, at Christmas, the angels appeared to the shepherds, and they say, I proclaim to you good news of great joy. Very good. Some people picked up on that. Great. And throughout the whole gospel, there's these encounters with joy. Zacchaeus receives Christ with joy. Um, the, the seed that bears great fruit is said to bring joy to the world. Um, there is more joy in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous, right, who have no need of repentance. Uh, at all the, go or the, the resurrection narratives, like the, the road to Emmaus, when the disciples encounter the risen Christ, it says they run back to Jerusalem with Joy, very good, right? It's everywhere, and we hear it even in today's reading, right? He sends the 72 out. They go to all these little villages. They proclaim the name of Christ. The demons are conquered, and it says they return home with joy. They return home rejoicing. And Jesus then goes on, he says, you know, it's great that you rejoice because I've seen Satan fall like lightning as well and rejoice in that. But I say to you, even more rejoice that your names are written in heaven, right? But joy, right? Joy is the, the gift to the, to the disciple who want, desires to make this journey to Jerusalem, to the place of sacrifice. I think it's important to also to know, you know, joy and happiness are not the same thing, right? All right so happiness is this, uh, it's an emotional elation, due to external factors, right? So if I eat a big box of nerds, I'm happy, right? If I watch a great rom-com, I'm happy, right? If I score a, a great round of golf, right? I presume I'll be happy. I've never done that before. Um, but see, happiness is all these external things. There's even this, uh, there's this world happiness index of countries, what countries are the most happy. And all the factors are all external, you know, it, it, the, the gross domestic product, you know, the health care, the, the freedom to self-determine your actions. Um, those are all external, which is why, it, ironically, right, the, some of the nations that are in the top 20 happiest nations in the world are also in the top 20 um, highest rates of suicide in the world, right? Because um, happiness is simply an emotion. Joy, joy is this state of being. Joy goes deep. Joy is this um, profound sense of peace at one's being given a purpose by God and being content with those gifts that God has poured out into our hearts. Right? 
That's joy, this profound contentedness, this profound peace. And so it's that joy that is offered to the disciple willing to go to Jerusalem. And so I propose a challenge. I, most of my homilies end with some kind of challenge, something easy that you can just do in a, a day, right? Um, so at some point this week, hopefully you'll spend that kind of uh, time with, with Christ in prayer. I give you the same challenge that Jesus gave to the disciples. Right? At the very end of the gospel, right, he says to them, right, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Or in other words, think about this. Right? He says to the disciples, think about it, contemplate this, reflect upon this reality, meditate that your names are written in heaven. Right? And so I think for each of us, you know, if, if we've accepted that, that free gift of salvation from Jesus Christ into our life, right, it's good to take time to stop and just contemplate, just meditate on the reality that your name is written in heaven. And so you take time this week to just sit with that reality, right? And meditating on that should increase within us this state of joy, right? And then having this joy, we will then be encouraged, enlivened, fueled to keep going to Calvary, keep going to the place of sacrifice.